Dr. Karen Miller is the Vice Dean for Research Strategy and Innovation and Professor of Environmental Health Sciences at the Bayesian School of Public Health at Columbia University. He was the founding director of Hercules Exposome Research Center at Emory University, the first exposome based research center in the US. He authored the first book on the topic, The Exposome of Primer, published by Elvis El Sevier. Uh, his research focuses on environmental drivers of neurodegeneration. His laboratory uses a variety of methods including transgenic mass production, immunohistochemistry, neurotransmitter transport assays, high resolution practical comics, electrochemistry, and behavioral assays. His work is conducted in several experimental models from cultural neurons and C elements to mice and human studies. He is an advisor to several exposome associated research entities, including the Human Biomonitoring for the European Union. He also serves as the editor in chief of Toxicological Sciences, the official journal of the Society of Toxicology. With this, I would like to welcome you all and hand over the stage to you. they would go through and sure enough they completed it 
in about 10 years, under budget, um, and way, way ahead of time. Um, and then last, about a year and a half ago, Craig Venter's group published a manuscript, a single manuscript, that included data on full genome sequencing of 10,000 people. And so you think about that advance and how long it takes this one, the first human genome, it was really phenomenal success. To the point now where if you go to uh, 23andMe or Ancestry.com, for $100 you can get information on thousands and thousands of genes. Um, Beijing Genomics uh, is doing full genome sequencing for about $500, and I think that we're not that far away from a $100 full human genome. And so there's really been these phenomenal advances in this area. Um, and in the United States, with our National Institutes of Health, the gene has really dominated. And I think the majority of the research from NIH is really funded around genomic causes of diseases. But we know that non-genomic factors are more important when you look at the overall incidence of complex diseases. And so when you think about this, the first um, ohm was, was the genome. Um, and this uh, was coined in 1920s, so about 100 years ago. And this idea of you know, the translation to protein, we call it proteome, and the ohms have been kind of this point of considering all contributing members of this. And a lot of people have used this. My personal favorite is the ridiculum, which just is poking fun at how people just add an ohm to something and make it a new science. Um, but I, I want to talk about one I think that is really uh, very critical. So Dr. Chris Wild, who is the director of the International Agency for Research on Cancer at the World Health Organization, coined the term exposome in 2005. And he was a uh, molecular epidemiologist who was trying to understand contributors primarily to cancer. And he realized, if you look at the epidemiology data, he was not getting good enough information on the environmental drivers of disease. And so he poses the concept as a way to advance exposure assessment. And for many years, this went nowhere. There was very little discussion of the exposome. And I think the challenge was that the definition was all exposures from conception onwards, including those from lifestyle, diet, and the environment. And this was dismissed by many people because it was seemingly impossible to do. That you, how would you possibly measure all of someone's exposures throughout their entire life when you go back you know, 20, 30 years, back to conception? Like it really was kind of a daunting task. Um, and then uh, a few years later, about 2010, Steve Rappaport and Martin Smith at Berkeley um, published a paper in Science, and there was a meeting at the National Academy of Sciences that really talked about this. And that was about the time that I became interested in this as a concept, where I felt we could make a contribution to it. Um, and so uh, about this time, uh, my colleague and Emory Dean Jones and I were thinking about this, and the challenge was that this idea of the totality of exposures made it very difficult to even start pursuing this question. And so we proposed a refined definition that had two very significant changes to it. Is that this is the cumulative measure, so the idea this is a quantifiable entity of environmental influences and the associated biological responses that occur throughout the lifespan, including exposure to the environment, diet, behavior, and endogenous processes. So the idea is that we, are, we have metabolism occurring. We are breaking down products that come into our diet. We have microbes that live on our skin and the mucous membranes in our gut, and they're transforming things that come into our body. And so this allows us to capture all that information, but the idea is to do it the way that we can actually quantify. And so our interest has been focusing on how we can actually make this a, a viable concept. But this was an interesting thing, was that we had written this article and submitted it to several journals. It was rejected many times, and I remember there was a comment where Someone said, this is a bit too philosophical. And, and my, my co-author was, he's like, I thought we had doctors in philosophy, right? We have PhD degrees, and it's a philosophical thing. And then shortly after I became editor-in-chief of Toxological Sciences, it got accepted. <laughs> um, and so when you look at the sort of history of uh, the exposome, you know, we've had over this a century on the genome side. But here on the exposome, it's really been focused just over the last many years. Um, the European Union had funded three large, uh, more like cohort studies on the exposome. Um, there was a group in Japan that was working on this. 
And then our center at Emory, called Hercules, which I'll talk about a bit more, was the first US center. And, and our view of this was that we didn't think we were ready to really do or measure the exposome. We were thinking about what was the technology we needed to start pursuing it and to focus on those basic technologies. Um, what's been exciting over the last few years is that even after this very short history, is that many universities in the US and abroad have been thinking about the exposome, having symposiums, starting centers and institutes around it. So we're, it's really, and it's getting coverage in a lot of magazines, is this concept is really starting to take off as a, as a viable concept to capture the complex environmental exposures. And so if you look at the sort of history here, you know, after Chris's first article in 2005, that was it. You know, for almost five years, there was not another article that mentioned exposome. Um, but now when you look at the last couple years, there's been a couple hundred articles, and I'm seeing about 20 papers a month come out on the topic of the exposome. So we're really starting to see it grow. <coughs> and so this, the Hercules Center was a center that we started at Emory. And the idea was to build the infrastructure to be able to pursue the exposome. And so the idea is we had very advanced analytical chemistry um, that uh, Dana Barr, who had just come from the Centers for Disease Control, had come to Emory University. Um, Dean Jones's work, which I'll talk more about, on the use of untargeted metabolomics and exposomics. Um, we had a lot of pilot awards, community engagement, and a really big part was building up our infrastructure for systems biology and data sciences to really get a handle on these overwhelming amount um, of data that we were really having coming in here. Um, but at the time, there was very little out there. Uh, when I taught with my first class on it, there wasn't any textbook of any sort, and so I wrote this first book, The Exposome of Primer, on this. Um, and even if you go back to things like, for example, there wasn't an entry on Wikipedia for the exposome. And so I had my students help write this first one out, and it's been, you know, it gets 30,000 hits a month now um, on Wikipedia. So it was a very early start, and it was, again, the, the first one in the United States. And this is an example of some of the technology that occurred during this time. So you think back about this advancing, going from sequencing individual bases to sequencing 3 billion in the human genome. If you look back at analytical chemistry and our ability to measure multiple things with chemical methods, in 1957, we could measure 20 amino acids at a time. This was very good for studying metabolism, understanding more errors of metabolism. But when you go to 2007, 50 years later, we could do about 200. So one order of magnitude in 50 years, when the human genome had gone multiple orders of magnitude. Um, but then over the last 10 years, we've really seen a major change. It was a combination of advances in mass spectrometry and different separation techniques, high resolution Orbi trap instruments, and then a lot of bioinformatics that allows us to pick up the information that's in the background of these spectra that initially look like noise, but they're actually reliable signals. To the point where with some of our instrumentation now, we can detect hundreds of thousands of features in one drop of blood. And these, I'm not saying that these are all individual chemicals, because often you'll have six or seven features that are describing a single molecule. But the idea is there's much more than the sort of 2,000 endogenously coded metabolites we think of. And what I believe these are, are a lot of these environmental factors coming into our diet through air and water and metabolites of those chemicals. And so the idea is with this very high resolution metabolomics, we're picking up a lot of these untargeted metabolites, the targeted environmental chemicals, and because we're measuring the endogenous metabolism, we're seeing how the body's responding to these challenges. And so this has been a big push about getting this technology advanced. And so thinking about metabolomics, this is a, a, a slide from Dave Wishart at the University of Alberta, who's been a pioneer in metabolomics. It's, you know, we think about you know, the, the sort of central dogma of the genome, the expression of proteins, and then you have metabolites. And the idea is that these, you have this initial driven by that genomic coding, but the external environment has a big effect on this metabolism. Um, from a measurement standpoint, if you were to measure someone's human genome, one of the beauties of this is that your core genome doesn't change over time. So it's steady throughout your lifespan, barring major mutations. Um, and if you look at changes in proteins, you have relatively slow changes in the proteins, but the metabolites 
very dynamic, and a lot of people like to look at these graphs and think it's noise because these metabolites are changing so fast. But they're changing so fast because biology is changing that fast. If you eat a meal, you've ingested probably thousands of different chemical features, not all exogenous, but you know, they could be plant-based, they could be food, whatever you come from. Um, and then you can have like, very sharp responses in catecholamines and stress hormones. And when you look at the sort of effect of these various ohms in a space, it turns out that the metabolome is the one closest to the ultimate phenotype. Like how you are right now, how you feel right now, your current health state is more reflected in your metabolome than your genome. Right, because your genome's been the same throughout your life. You get sick one day, your genome didn't change, but your metabolome has changed very much in response to whatever challenge you're facing. And so while it's very dynamic and poses many measurement challenges, it is the one that's worth pursuing. And so what we've built up over the last several years is this platform where we're using a combination of liquid chromatography and gas chromatography, which lets us pick more water-soluble and gas-soluble molecules um, using these high-resolution instruments. Um, and it's a lot of data processing, bioinformatic analysis, um, but ultimately we get information on uh, you know, semi-volatile and volatile compounds, things like terpenes, waxes, flavonoids, a lot of chlorinated pollutants, brominated flame retardants, we can pick all of these things up in the system. And a lot of the sort of like organic amines and acids and the more uh, water soluble things you would typically see um, through mass spectrometry. But when you combine the two, you really get this large coverage of chemicals that are capturing the exogenous chemicals as well as the endogenous metabolites. And so this also includes like pharmaceuticals you may be taking and their metabolites as well. Um, again, a big part of this has been the software development on figuring out this analysis. And so this mummy chalk program was written by Shisao Lee at Emory, one of the members of our team. Um, and this was a, a program where what he was doing was if you had a bunch of relatively unknown metabolites, you would find things that, it, it's kind of explain this, is that if you, if you get a description of a particular metabolite, it's hard to tell exactly what it is with some of the identification. But for example, if you're looking at an automobile, you might say, well, I know what model it was, I know what color it was, but I don't know what year it was. You still have information on it, but you're not quite sure. And so the idea was that we would typically wait until we knew exactly what the identity of that molecule was. And to do that, it takes multiple levels of analytical chemistry. You can wait years for that. You can't build a model from that. But, if, but his, his idea was that, well, if we know approximately what it is, and you start lining these things up, you can actually start building pathway maps to biology based on statistical algorithms and they go through and do this. And it's really been phenomenal. I'll show some examples of how well this has helped kind of fill in these gaps of some of these partially known compounds. Um, Kron Upal, another member of our team, has developed some very nice network level software where one of the things we're trying to do is incorporate what we know about the human genome with what's happening in the metabolism or even like proteomic level analysis. And so this program lets us map together in this sort of multi-omic space. And so we have a clinical population that has genomics and transcriptomics and phenotyping data and metabolomics. It's a way to bring all the data together into a unified model. Um, an example of, of one of these studies that uh, some of my colleagues have done so this was looking at a population that the National Cancer Institute and I have been following for many years. They were workers that were exposed to trichloroethylene as part of their job. And they were following them for incidents of cancer. Renal cancer was one of the most common. And so you have this occupational data and you have these disease outcomes. So they had banked plasma from the patients and we did this high resolution metabolomics on them. And what we found were uh, many different metabolites of trichloroethylenes. We found all these trichloroethylene-related biomarkers. And then we also found alterations in the immune system and uh, markers of renal damage. And so the idea is that this, in this essentially one drop of blood, you were getting information that reflected the occupational exposure, telling you which chemicals were actually in the person's body and then how those pathways were affecting ultimately the outcome of cancer. 
And so the idea is you will really be able to marry in this occupational data to the outcomes, and again, do it by just having a sample of blood. And that's really been one of the goals. What can we do if we only have this individual sample from a person? Um, we also had worked very hard on just advancing technology. So a colleague of mine at Georgia Tech, um, which is just down the road from Emory, where I was at the time, he had developed uh, microneedle patches for delivery of flu vaccine. And so this has been something that's in trials now. You've probably read about it. And so the idea is he would take a desiccated vaccine, put it in this patch that had microneedles, and it would deliver the vaccine into the skin. And it doesn't need refrigeration because it's, been, it's desiccated. And I went to Mark and I asked him, like, could you make something that went in reverse, that actually drew out the interstitial fluid from underneath the skin, and then we could analyze it by mass spectrometry? And he's an engineer, and he said, oh, sure, we could do that. I'm an engineer. So what well, he did, and so we gave him one of these pilot grants, and he developed this microneedle patch array. And here what you see is this hydrogel. And so this is a gel that, that is swelling as the interstitial fluid comes into the space. And so this is still under development, but the idea is that we can, we can get this um, interstitial fluid collected through this patch, and it's only about 10 microliters, but that's enough for us to run our mass spectrometry on it. And we can see all these different changes in metabolism. Um, and interestingly, the, the concordance between what you see in plasma and this interstitial fluid is like 90%. There's a huge amount of what we see in there is, is what you see in plasma. Um, and so we're still working on developing this. We have another paper uh, under review right now. But I think this would be something that the goal is having a way where you can get information on people that doesn't require them to go into a doctor's office or have a, you know, a trained personnel do the blood collection, something they could do at home. And so it really helps the idea of getting this out to people and really democratizing some of these activities. Um, more recently, this is one of the, uh, I'll make several examples of my excitement to be in Columbia. Um, so I got a call uh, 31 days ago from an investigator at Columbia, a biomedical engineer, um, asking if I was interested in applying for a grant with him. And so we put this together, and essentially what we proposed is taking data from over 10,000 patients we've done metabolomics on and using machine learning and network science to identify key markers of health outcomes. And then what he can do is he can take, so for example, I say here are the 50 key markers you need to identify a person who may perform well in a certain condition. What he's able to do is put these into a nano array sensor that can be implanted under the skin that can, through just regular sort of telemetry, can go out to a computer. So the idea is you would have a way of measuring dozens of metabolites in real time from interstitial fluid from this small little device and thing from under the skin. And so the idea is that there's opportunities for technology here that can really help revolutionize how we monitor things and do so in a very, um, you know, I think ultimately when you get these things with the companies, and Ken started three or four companies with a lot of his devices, and I think this is the type of thing that we can get interest from um, companies to help develop some of these technologies. Um, so this idea is we have uh, you know, these sorts of technologies, we can measure um, a lot of this information, but how do you get this more into the clinical and population research and ultimately into precision medicine? And so I'm going to give an example of one of our earlier projects that just started um, about a year and a half ago. So we were contacted by a group at the Mayo Clinic who had done very deep genomic phenotyping on this disease called primary sclerosing cholangitis. It is the primary reason that people need to have liver transplants in the United States. And unfortunately, that is the only treatment for it. There's no drugs that help. If all it is, you're waiting to, to develop this in-terminal, this in-stage disease. They also have a very high rate of cancers. Um, and the Mayo Clinic, though, sees 5% uh, of all patients that have this disease. So they have a very good registry. They follow many of the patients. Um, they have a large overlap with inflammatory bowel disease. And what they were saying is that we have patients, and we really have no idea how they're going to progress. We don't know which ones are more likely that are going to fail in the liver or are more likely to have cancer. We have really zero information. 
And they've done all the genome-wide association studies. They've done very deep genome and phenotype now. Um, and they've heard about this concept of the exposome through our center, and they said, would you be interested in collaborating on this? And so we said, yeah, let's do a pilot study with this. And so they sent us samples from 200 patients. These were samples they already had banked. Very, a relatively low end for, for studies, but we had uh, patients that had primary sclerosis and cholangitis, controls, and then this related primary biliary cholangitis, a different liver disease, but it was just a kind of a, a control group. Um, and then we had them split between having inflammatory bowel disease or not. So a relatively small population for this pilot study. And so we did our um, work with the pathway of doing this high resolution metabolism exposed with this liquid chromatography and gas chromatography. And we identified um, many metabolites that were changing in these patients and seeing both a combination of endogenous biology and ex, you know, chemicals we saw from the environment. Um, and so just an example here, so we would find you know, you know, various fungicides, personal care products, insecticides, herbicides, other commercial chemicals. Um, and this is showing that we, can, we have a measurement of many of these different pesticides we have in here. And so this is not necessarily saying that we're seeing a cause and effect. This is a disease association study because all the patients already have the disease. It's just trying to find out clues as to who may do better or worse um, when, when they have to be identified. But we were able to identify over 200 um, environmental chemical biomarkers in this study um, using this new technology. It's actually the first study where we combined these two technologies to them. Um, and so what was really interesting here was that we also found um, alterations in pathways with bile acids. And so when I first showed this data to them, I said, well, this is, I guess it's kind of good to see it, but it's not very exciting, is that we saw changes in these bile acid pathways. And they said, well, you know, we, we, we didn't really explain this to you, but these patients, they were diagnosed with a disease they hadn't have been. But when we gave you the samples, they were, their clinical chemistry was normal. So they appeared normal when you do your normal studies of clinical chemistry, but we were detecting these very uh, dramatic changes in, uh, in the pathways of metabolites, which we have since um, confirmed through other uh, methodologies, where you saw these various uh, um, bile acids altered in the patients that had um, PSC. So we were actually picking up that endogenous biology piece. Um, and then we also again found many of these different chemicals, some of them were preservatives, this fungicide, and showing that many of these things were driving changes in dozens or hundreds of different metabolites that they were associated with that, and saw various pathways that were altered um, in the patients that had been shown before that have some connection and alteration in the disease. And now it's not, again not about this causation, and I think that one of our interesting thoughts was the idea that a fungicide was elevated in these patients, but if most of them have an inflammatory bowel disease, they also have that sort of leaky gut syndrome. And so maybe what we're seeing is a higher penetrance of the fungicides on grains showing up in their blood. So it, it may not be directly causing the disease, but these, this was information no one really knew about. Like, so the idea is you're learning more about these processes. And again, this was done on only 200 patients. So we took that data and applied for a grant to the National Institutes of Health, to the National Institutes of uh, Digestive Disease and Kidney Disorders. Um, and what I was excited about was that we used the word exposome in the title of this grant. And this was, we were, I believe it was the first time that someone had talked about the exposome outside of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And the idea was to do this first uh, uh, multi-omics study capturing the, some of those environmental exposures, creating this data source, and using over 800 patients in each of those categories I described. So we're scaling this up 20-fold. Um, and so this was um, awarded uh, several months ago, um, over 8 million US dollars in this RC2 format to do this very level genomic exposure format. And so the work has to be done still, but the idea that this is a place where they were ready to start looking at these complex environmental exposures in an area where they really had not studied this before. Um, and so then this brings me to uh, Columbia. I said I've been there about six months, and 
Um, I was very excited about this move because I feel that as we move the exposome into these sort of clinical populations, I had to have access to people to, to do this. And so Columbia has a, a very strong group in precision medicine. And as you would typically see, um, one of the first things they did as they developed their precision medicine group was to develop the laboratory of personalized genomic medicine. This is what we do, in, especially in the United States, is that you want to start something on personalized medicine or population health, you go right to the genetics first. That's the first thing you do. Um, again, knowing that that can only account for 10 to 20% of the variation, but that's step one. Um, what I was excited about was the Irving Institute, which was our clinical and translational science group. I met with the director, Murdoch Riley, during my recruitment, and he said, I want to bring the exposome into our center. The idea that I think if we can add these things in because we have this very deep genomic phenotyping, we want to bring this into it. So I'm working with Murdoch to set up and replicate all that we had done at Emory in this platform at Columbia. Um, and again, I mentioned this for the challenge of the data, is Columbia has a very, uh, very strong data science institute, and we've been working closely with them to work on processing much of the data, um, and, and I'll talk about some more of the work we've done with them. But it's been very exciting to come to a university that has this very large role in this all of us research program funded by NIH to look at a million patient populations that'll give us the access to, I would do these studies about 50,000 people. Um, and so it's, I think it's really the right place to bring the exposure up, up to scale. Um, so this example here is that we've been working on uh, this partnership with the Data Science Institute with the existing strength we have in, in public health at Mailman, and we're trying to develop this program in data science for health. And so Jeanette Wynn, who leaves the Data Science Institute, is more of a computer science engineer type um, person, but they're trying to reach out in different areas. And so we're trying to bring this team together so we can go solve complex health related problems using the very best data science that's out there. And so it's something that's in, in progress, and I think that we'll be uh, pulling this together over the next weeks to months to get this going. So again, a very exciting part about being a vice dean of research is I get to kind of shepherd these sorts of initiatives um, to do really uh, strong programs. Um, other examples, so I, this was a very interesting paper. Uh, it came out in Science uh, about a year ago um, by Jan of Ehrlich. And what he had done is he had access to genomic data on the over 13 million people. And so this was a gigantic family tree study, essentially. And, and what they concluded after this was that previously it was thought about 25% of uh, longevity was determined by genes. But in this study, they brought that number down to 16%. So what they're saying is that your genomics can only account for 16% of longevity, and that longevity has even more to do with the environment and behavior than had been thought. I'm thinking, that's the exposome. That's exactly what I want to do. So not that I needed the validation, but it was good to see this happen. And Yadav is at Columbia University. So another partner I can have to kind of do this gene by environment interaction. So it's been um, really exciting to strike up these new collaborations. Um, so some work that I had done um, when I was still at Emory, um, looking at Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is one of my postdocs that looked at, again, a relatively small study, kind of high-level studies of mild cognitive impairment controls. We had a bunch of genotyping done. And one of the interesting initial findings was that we saw an elevation of a metabolite of DDE, which is a metabolite of DDT, in the patients with Alzheimer's. So we think about how long will we stop using DDT, it still persists. I could still detect it in all of you if I wanted to. And the idea that we see these associations, but one thing I was really excited about is that we do this in an untargeted format. We're looking for everything. There's no preordained bias. It's not a priori. We're looking at anything. Was a paper came out three years ago that found that another DDE metabolite elevated in a different population of people with Alzheimer's disease. So the idea we already kind of this, had this external validation that our unbiased approach was finding very similar things. We also found alterations in glutamine, which has been shown before in Alzheimer's, and some other dietary derivatives that, again, it was, it was actually metabolites of pepper, and we don't think it's meaning that pepper is involved in the disease, but more it's a reflection of the changes in diet 
when people develop the disease, they, they don't eat the same foods, and so you see these alterations. But it also shows that this approach picks up dietary factors as well as just general environmental. Um, and so then after I decided to come uh, to Columbia, I spoke with Richard Mayhew, who's the chair of neurology, and he said, well, I have a very large cohort of Alzheimer's disease patients who have been following them for 25 years. Um, it's a very rich, um, ethnically diverse group where there are about a third African American, um, a third Caucasian, and about a third Dominican Republic um, Hispanic. And, and so we said, let's do a pilot study on this, and we ran, again, about 80 patients total. And we were able to separate out the different ethnic populations when he said when they did their genome-wide association, they couldn't do that. They couldn't see it that way. But the metabolism and the metabolites do reflect it, which probably has more to do with like dietary patterns and cultural things that make the differences there, but we were able to do that. But then strikingly, picking out the cases and controls, we were able to pull those apart very easily. And this was data that we ran on the mass spec and my graduate student had 24 hours to make this sort of for the grant application. So again, this is data we can deliver very quickly. Um, and so we have um, submitted a couple different grants on this, but to do it in thousands of patients. So he has 8,000 people in the study, and we want to do the metabolomics exposomics on all of them. Um, and so again, it was this opportunity to collaborate with people at Columbia to really scale up some of these activities. Um, and so one of the challenges with our untargeted metabolomics profiling is, again, only about 10,000 of these things, of like the couple hundred thousand we see, we really know exactly what they are. There's many of them that are unknown metabolites. And a lot of people, again, have this, if you don't, they don't care, it's like, if I don't know exactly what it is, I, I can't trust it. But if I have an, a match to charge ratio out multiple digits, and I know retention times, I know it's a reliable, entity. I just have to know which ones to focus on to determine by structural biology. Um, and I think what we've seen is that um, groups that the scripts have added like almost a million new compounds into the libraries. Um, and the idea is that companies are saying that you can subscribe to this compound, like you have the description, and once we identify what it is, then you'll know. And so this idea of having a lot of unknowns is kind of like before the Human Genome Project. We didn't really know what was on that chromosome, but over time we started figuring those things out. So just because we don't know the precise identity doesn't mean we can't follow up and figure those things out. And that's where I think these very large disease association studies, so if you say, I found 10 unknowns strongly correlated to Alzheimer's, I now have motivation to do the structural work to figure out what those are. But I, to go do it on 10,000 of them, but I don't know which ones are driving disease is an efficient use of, of time or resources. <clears throat> so again, like while we can have this information in the sort of clinical population studies, how does it get back to understanding the biology of it? And I think there's many ways to do this, but I'm just going to give an example of one of the things that my lab is doing. Um, and that's using the model organism C. elegans, so like these small nematodes, they're about a millimeter long. They were really essential. It was actually the first genome that was sequenced was C. elegans. And the cell death genes, the apoptosis genes, were first identified in C. elegans. So, so it's been a mainstay in genetics, but really not been used that much in toxicology and environmental work. Um, and so we've worked with people that uh, have developed these automated, um, automatic analyses of lifespan, it's called this lifespan machine. It's a really ingenious system where you take these plates and you put them on a flatbed scanner. The way you used to scan things for your computer, and you just you buy a bunch of the scanners and you put them in your incubator, and it just goes through and looks at the, at the worms every 15 minutes. Uses some algorithms and can actually show if whether or not they're alive or dead, and you can track them over their very short two to three week life. But unless you start automating and scaling these things up. Um, so this was interesting because my lab had been studying a Parkinson's disease for many years, and we've been making transgenic mice that had alterations in the ability to store dopamine and nor um, norepinephrine and serotonin. And we've done this work in mice that have been shown to work in, in humans. Um, and the, the C. elegans worm have a work log of the same gene. And so we were able to, to use this and, and have uh, well, it may take me four or five years to publish a paper on a, on a gene knockout mouse, 
I can just, from a catalog, pay $7 shipping, get the knockout worm from the repository. It's really an amazing system. And we can do behavior on the worms. We can see how they move. We can actually get cognitive function in the worms. And so this is a really good way of kind of bringing these things together. And what's amazing is all this metabolomics I've talked about, this untargeted metabolomics, is we can do all of this on just 500 worms. And most other like uh, nuclear magnetic resonance metabolomics, you need like 300,000 worms to do this work, very bulk levels. But we can do the same platform that we're using in the human studies in this model organism. And, and 500 worms is very little, it's a very easy thing to do. And so what you can imagine is that if you had a population that had a certain type of exposures, a, a characteristic 20 or 30 or 40 or 100 different exposures, we can recapitulate that in our worm model and, and see how it's affecting biology. And we can also do it in any sort of mutant line you want. So if you want to look for a gene-environment interaction, it's very easy for us to model this. And so this is one of the things that we're trying to do now, is we've developed a system for this high-throughput screening. And we believe that we can test, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has about 1,200 compounds on their high priority list. And so in trying to decide, well, which ones of those should we test, we said, let's test all of them. There's no reason we can't scale this up, really borrowing very much from the pharmaceutical industry on high throughput screening, um, and using these high throughput flow sorter systems to look at um, all these and then run our mass spectrometry so we get data on metabolites, data on the exposures, and then narrow it down to do the, the longevity assays and even doing these um, tests of cognitive function. And it is quite amazing, but the worms do have memory and they can learn tasks, um, and you can test them on that. And so this is something we've been trying to do to, um, to bring together thinking about looking at environmental drivers of cognitive decline. So we can look at populations that people have studied at, at Columbia, where they've done very extensive functional um, resonance imaging in the brain of humans, all the high complex cognitive tests, and do those in parallel in the worms with these complex exposures. And so it really brings you up to this higher scale. And so, you know, thinking about where we are in this sort of exposome type research, um, you know, there's been a lot of activity over the last few years. Uh, this human biomonitoring for the European Union, I'm on their advisory board that has like 40 nations in the EU. Um, you know, the question is, where is this going to be 10 years from now? Where is, where is the kind of goal? And so I've been thinking about this quite a bit. You know, for, for many years, this concept of the exposome was this nondescript, fuzzy, I think these were actually from grant reviews I saw as how reviewers said it, and rather unscientific idea. But I think now we can say it represents a new science and a new way of approaching how the environment affects health by looking at it in, its, in the complex totality of it. Um, and so as a new field, we really have to work to establish and defend the identity of it thinking about its core principles and, and forging a path forward. And so right now what I'm trying to work on is how to establish this discipline. I'm working with um, Oxford University Press to develop a new journal around the topic. We're talking about forming a society and setting up regular meetings. Um, we, we think we had, the, in New York City, we think we had the kickoff meeting for this. Um, Mount Sinai and Columbia collaborated for the first New York Exposum Symposium. Um, and I've been working with people um, across the world on this too. And I think it's important to kind of focus on the simplicity of the concept as we do this. And so one of the steps is forming this consortium. So this is something that was initially focused in the US between Columbia, Emory, Mount Sinai, and Brown University. And it turns out a couple of our postdocs at Emory went to Mount Sinai, also in New York. And so we've rep we're replicating the system we had at Emory at Mount Sinai and at Columbia. So we have multiple universities using the identical platform. Um, and, and then also more recently, NSERM in France has agreed to kind of um, work on this collaboration. I think the idea is to really work on the intra-laboratory validation, harmonization of measures, uh, standardization, standardization of operating procedures. Yeah, I think it's really important to have radical transparency in the methodology. Um, shared uh, pooled standards with something we've been doing for a long time and sharing the bioinformatic platforms. And so we started working on this and I've had pretty good interest here in, in, in Europe. So um, with, within the European Union projects, University of Paris and NSERM, 
uh, Masaryk in the Czech Republic, a group at U Utrecht in the Netherlands, Antwerp, held once in Germany, um, and then these groups, Mayo Clinic is joined on two in the United States. So we have this really nice project going between the US and Europe, but I'd like some partners down here for this too, as I think that it's something that really needs to bring in um, representatives from all major research um, countries, and I think that's how we're really gonna drive this forward by thinking about it in the context people have um, in different problems. And then one of the challenges too is that these sorts of projects typically don't have a single funding agency, right? So the idea is that people are coming together for the goodwill of the field to do it. They have resources for their research, but how do you do these sort of collaborative things? But I think it's been, um, we're off to a very good start. Again, I'd like to see some partners from um, other um, countries. Um, so if you want to learn more about this, uh, this paper just came out in Annual Reviews of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Um, if you can't have access to it, feel free to email me at gary.miller at columbia.edu. Very easy email address. Um, next, um, in July, we're teaching a two-day workshop on the exposome. Um, this is just a, very much going through our workflow that we've developed and how you go through the mass spectrometry and the informatics you need to go through to do this process. And many of these approaches are applicable to different platforms. Um, interesting, we, we didn't discuss this, but I've been talking to, um, our plan is actually to do this at the Global Center in Paris. And so we should maybe think about having it here at some point. So um, it'll, it'll be the first time we teach it in New York in July as we do that. We'd like to see if we could, if we could farm it out. And that, actually, one of my graduate students is from India, and I'm sure she would love to come out. We would love to have her. Um, and so this is a very nice review. And this was something, too, that had a, a you know, group from um, Emory in Columbia, but Utrecht and Imperial College in London. So we've had this sort of international um, collaboration on this, and I don't really think it's moving along. Um, just to kind of show you some of my aspirations. So, you know, our goal right now, we can do this very complex analysis for about $250 a sample. And we'd like to get this under $50. We want something that can really be used in large scale studies, ultimately get into the clinic, but to do that, we really have to drive the cost down. Um, and then also having a sample collection format, whether it be that patch or some other sort of micro little device. Um, where we can get that sample performed in any setting without these specialized training and really get these things out there. So these are kind of my, my long-term goals here. Um, so I've been looking at you know, lessons from other projects like the Human Genome Project. Uh, I've talked to many people who have been involved with this. And I was reviewing this paper that had this sort of reflection on this. And I was struck by the opening quote was from uh, James Watson that is essentially immoral not to get it, the human genome sequencing done as fast as possible. So this was like early on in this, that's what he said when the human genome project was starting. So it was just almost uh, you know, moral not to do that. And I went back and looked at, again, I feel like my book that I wrote is very old. I wrote it in 2013, and I'm working on the new edition of it. But I think that it was odd that the majority of the discussion of Darwin occurs among geneticists when natural selection is primarily driven by the environment, the environment is the exposome, is what is driving natural selection. If one removes the external forces acting upon our genome, evolution would grind to a halt. Right, so the idea is that this, this is an important thing for fundamental biology to understand how these external factors are affecting us, and we need an effort as strong as we had on the genomic side. So at that New York City exposome, I put up this quote, that it's essentially moral not to get the human exposome project done as fast as possible, right? We need to know this, um, to, to borrow that from, from Watson. Um, and with that, I want to thank people, one, for the hospitality, my cultural immersion, uh, the intellectual intrigue, and getting me out of the snow, because that's what New York City looks like right now. <laughs> and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.